Hi, welcome back to Lilytown Williams's Immigrant Speak Show. I am her co-host Amani. Today, I am honored and very pleased to welcome back Miss Katerina Lu from、uh, Czech Republic. Formerly, she has、uh, told us her story growing up in Czech Slovakia under communism, and、uh, she has、uh, told us her journey to freedom from Czech Republic to America and how. And she has seen some similarities, especially in the recent years here in the U.S., and that alerted her. And she has some concerns about、uh, communism looming on the horizon in America here. And today we are more than happy to welcome her back to show us a presentation of memories of communism in Czechoslovakia. Welcome back, Katrina. Thank you for having me. Hello. <laughs> Yeah,、um, show us what you have there、um, of memories of communism in Czechoslovakia, which is the country that you grew up in and、uh, left for freedom in America. Okay, so as you said, I'm from Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia is very small but very beautiful country in the middle of Europe, and uh, uh, I just want to open with that the Czech people are. Kind of survivors. We survived three hundred years of Habsburg rule and Hitler occupation, six years and forty years of communism, and we always emerge kind of victorious. We always win over these、uh, oppressive systems. But、uh, I want to talk about communism because communism relatively was very short period in our history. It was only forty years between nineteen forty eight and nineteen eighty nine. But it nearly destroyed economy, which, in the past, was one of the strongest in Europe. So、uh, that's why I came to your show because I want to talk about that.、Uh, our communism wasn't as horrific as it was in China or Korea or you know Vietnam, Cuba,、uh, because as I said, we had a very strong, robust economy, and the communists inherited it.、Um, But you know, we like every communist country. We had not enough、uh, supplies, and the healthcare wasn't good, and housing wasn't good. We stand in long lines for everything, so that's common. But I want to talk more about what I will show on these slides. It's really the economic side of、uh, communism. But I I would like to talk a little bit about what I feel and see in America in a recent. Years or month, and that's really the suppression of the free speech, and that is what worries me the most. Because I remember when we grow, when I was growing up, that was uh, what uh, we felt the most: the, the suppression of civil freedoms,、uh, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, because the government controlled. All the media censored all、uh, the information to promote its agenda. The government、uh, also controlled all the cultural organization,、uh, schools,、uh, you know, education, research, and you know they were making sure that all these institutions、uh, promote their ideology and、uh, they didn't allow any alternative viewpoints. So there was always limited access to information.、Uh, there was a lot of propaganda, and of course, there was, you know, a big suppression of any dissent. So, and that's what I'm starting to feel here. Yeah, I am pretty sure you know that, right? Yes.、Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree because I was actually part of that propaganda system back in China. I worked for the government's propaganda sector for about eight years, and、so、you know very well how it works.、Right? Yeah, I see all the tactics that they're using nowadays in Western media, like the using the same label over and over and over again on a group of people or or a certain individual until people accept that as a matter of fact. That's what I and we had to do back in China. Um, yeah, and and just、You're、right, you know, it's a, it's the kind of brainwashing that's very subtle. It's、mm. a It, it creeps into your minds as if you don't even realize it. You just listen to it every day. It、uh, eventually becomes physical when you hear a word, or you hear a person's name. You automatically have a negative or a positive reaction to it. That's that, that kind of brainwashing is is I I see that kind of tactic here. It's extremely scary. Yeah. yeah, extremely scary, and I really do see it now、mm -hmm. here. And again, as you said, people don't even realize that people 
don't even know it's happening you know this is this is a phenomena i kind of observe that you know when you live in a society where freedom of expression is suppressed mm -hmm. it can be psychologically damaging it, uh, it, it leads to these feelings of like you're isolated you're frustrated you're hopeless you know and also because you have the ever-present censorship and propaganda uh it kind of creates this culture of distrust people don't trust each other you know suspicion people start to snitch on each other you know and uh, you see it you see it here yeah, yeah. Uh, you know if you if you are trained to see it if you are sensitive to it mm -hmm. uh you see it you know you see it very uh, yeah i agree you see it very clearly it's like living people are like constantly living in fear and hate for each other and that makes them angry and miserable all the time and is their personality starts to change their behaviors yes, start yes. to change they become hostile towards each other and that's you know that they then they become much easier to control because they hate yes. each other they're fighting each other it's they're, it's they're, something what i want to mention because you know the slides they'll show you how we lived what the economy was like but it will not show you the mind. You know, I also think that uh, this, uh, you know, this kind of preconditioned people to, uh, you know, people were of course like compelled to hide their thoughts and their feelings, and mm -hmm. they kind of resort to lying and cheating so they can navigate the system. You know, yeah. it was like a. I, I want to use the word moral relativism because mm -hmm. it created this type of moral relativism when people started to lie and break the law and it was acceptable because yeah. it served you know to circumvent the system really yeah. you know to get around the system so yeah. that is very dangerous and you see some people today here who basically talk themselves into believing what mm -hmm. they hear just to yeah, they, they kind of accept it, uh, yeah. you know, the way we were accepted, exactly what you were talking about. So, yeah, I promised myself I would never live in, in oppression again. And and because I'm witnessing the same gaslighting or gaslighting and the persecution, you know, of political opp opponents, I'm very worried. And that's why I wanted to come to your show. And I really appreciate that. I, I did the same promise to myself. I would never live in oppression again. I'd rather die in liberty than living under oppressive regime again. And so that's what I said to myself years exactly. ago. Exactly. And I would and I would add and I want to speak against it now. You know, when I was growing up in communism, I was relatively like young. I was, you know, a little you know, a few years out of college when the communism f fell. And uh, you know, so when you're young you don't really have the the drive to fight. But now I feel like we have to fight. We Absolutely. cannot let it happen here. Absolutely. You know? Okay, now let's. Okay, let's so, and of course, you know, right. this regime had economic, you know, right. impact as well. So, this is the, my slides. So, you see the opening screen, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, those are my little memories. Those are not just my memories. Some of my friends, uh, you know, some resources online I use for the pictures, and some of my friends supplied uh, some pictures. So, I just put together a little presentation. So, let's go. <laughs> It looks really good in Zoom. I'm excited <laughs> to see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is this is kind of the picture of the everyday life. Uh, uh, we call it gray society. We used to call our life gray, until of course, and this is a little joke. Until of course, the Russians or the Soviet Union came up with um, uh, uh, color TV, and then they started to show us a color pictures on the TV. You know, in like 70s, and the color was mostly like what you see on a bottom picture. Everything was green. So from then on, we didn't live in a gray society. We lived in a green society. But that was a joke because the quality of the TV was so very low. So you see this uh, the the upper picture. I don't know. Can you see my pointer going around mm -hmm. the pictures? Yeah. yeah. So this upper picture uh, is a picture uh, of uh, the projects, you know, the housing projects. We had mm. shortage of housing all the time. People had to put them uh, selves on a list to get, a, you know, apartment or house. So they started to build these ugly, ugly kind of buildings. They never really... They built the buildings, but they never really made the surroundings very nice. So when we were little kids, we were playing basically in a construction site, as you can see there, you know, and it was quite normal. We kind of all, you know, 
mm-hmm. accepted it. You know, uh, this picture on the right hand side, a uh, picture with the car and tent. This was kind of the typical um, vacation because we didn't have any money and we also didn't have permit to travel abroad unless it was to other communistic countries. So mm-hmm. most of us just took a tent and we, you know, spent summer somewhere on the tent with a little. This is a Škoda car that was actually made in Czech. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was also a car you had to wait on the list for for like 10 years before you could get it. So this was our typical vacation. I think today Americans would find this very romantic. Uh, but at I the time, okay. <laughs> you know, it was the only option. So it's not so romantic when it is the only option, you know. So mm-hmm. that's what it was. And here, you know, this, this is a street from where my grandma used to live in Prague. And, uh, uh it was always there was always construction there, it was always kind of ugly there nothing was ever finished you know mm-hmm. they finished one project they started another you know it looks a little bit like what new york city looks today mm-hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wanted to make a comment on especially the housing projects they make that's exactly the same case in china like they they make yeah. these residential like the you know shoe, shoe boxes of uh of apartment buildings and you have to get on a list, you have to wait and you, there are like a hundred conditions, like you have to um, qualify, you have to meet to qualify for having a, a government a distributed, exactly. appropriated. Exactly, you exactly right. It's not just getting the apartment, it's to qualify. Yeah. So if you have yeah. a bad, you know, reputation mm-hmm. of communist party, you might never get a house yeah, exactly. or apartment. Exactly. And it's like when I was working in China Radio International, which is the central government's propaganda radio station, it was like the highest um, ranking um, department, basically, uh, in 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 the party hierarchy. Like they had a very strict rule about, you know, how you can qualify for applying for an apartment. Like, for example, if you're a woman, you don't. You never will be qualified. Um, it, it, only men <laughs> are qualified to apply for an apartment because women can get married and then they can live in their husband's <laughs> apartments. Okay, so, like, so um, as I said before, our communism wasn't as bad, I think. Yeah. But you're right. You know, now I'm thinking about it. You're right. Yeah, only like married couple would get apartments. Yes. Yeah, yes. single yes. stone. Yeah. 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 So I was like put into like a dormitory room with another uh, with no, uh, other two single women. Like if you're single, you live with other single people in one room. You, it doesn't matter how old you are. As long as you don't get married, you don't get to apply for an apartment. So you yeah. don't have any privacy. I, I remember when I first started to work, I lived in one of these dormitories also. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. many similarities. It's it's astounding, you know. Like I I I, I think I blocked it out in my memory by now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long yeah. ago. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the next slide, maybe. Right. So these are there is a couple of slides here where I'm showing the forever. I I apologize for the quality of the pictures because those are obviously very old pictures and, you know, they were kind of so, you know, copied and copied. But this was like one of the typical lines. They probably got something what usually we wouldn't have. So this might be, you know, for some type of vegetables or fruits or something we usually wouldn't get. So people immediately lined up and then they would, you know, bait in lines forever so this uh, particle is uh, a grocery store so that's line to grocery store the next one uh, this is for bread and pastries so probably they got fresh bread if you didn't line up for it uh you probably didn't get fresh bread you know if you come later in the afternoon they don't have anything anymore so you have to line up or you have to send your grandma if you're working you see there's a lot of old people in a line right mm-hmm. um and that is because people worked, so they would send their grandmas to go shopping for them, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. So, so that's another line. And I have another line here. This uh, this shop is uh, called was called Tuzex, and that was the only shop where you can get uh, luxurious products like jeans, cosmetics, and stockings. And we actually used um, special money for it. So this was not paid for by Czech Krons. This was paid for by, by these coupons. And you could only get the coupons if you had uh, some kind of success at work, if you were a successful member of the party or, you know, uh, so, so it was a very, very special shop. But even there, people were lining up because, of course, 
this kind of economy gave uh, a gateway to a uh, black market. So there were a lot of people standing around Lutuzex who would be selling these coupons, you know, like on the a, on a side, it was mm -hmm. uh, the, the black market economy. And so people line up there, they buy the coupons, they, they go and buy, buy themselves for you know, jeans or something. Oh, that was bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you see these yeah. cars here. Those are the checkmate and East German made cars. Uh, this is in the 70s. Yeah, of course, you can see the difference there. The cars were not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not everybody yeah, had we them. Didn't yeah. We didn't even have luxury product pro products <laughs> at the time. There was no such a thing as jeans until early 90s. Um, oh, I'm sure I'm sure the the party uh the party representatives and officers had jeans. I'm oh, sure they yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. But, the, but oh, ordinary people never even had a, had heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I actually I actually didn't eat it until I was a, a teenager, mm -hmm. I think. I realized that there is a shop like this and you can actually buy the coupons on a black market and go shopping there. Until then, I didn't really know that it exists either, you know. Yeah. It's so, so sad. So my next slide is still related to shopping. So there are line, lines for everything. You know, you get oranges, line. You get bananas, line, you know. And then also this, uh, uh, this picture here is uh, a butcher shop. And this is, if you come around like noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, that's what butcher shop looks like. Also, you might actually ask the butcher for extra money to save meat for you under the counter. So these um, people, you know, these ladies probably had some meat under the counter. You pay a little bit extra and then the butcher saves it for you because, you know. It's so just, everyone becomes dishonest, you know. Exactly. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. There's no honesty left in the system, in the society, because you can't be honest and survive at the same time. So it's just so sad. It's just like, it, it destroys human decency. I have exactly, yeah. That, it, it has a definitely very profound psychological effect on mm -hmm. um, people. And and uh, I was saying that to Lily, last time I was talking on your show, uh, I still see it in older people when I go back to Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. I still see that that tendency to not be completely honest. You mm -hmm. know, it's just the, the, the regime really damaged people a lot. I mean, yeah. The damage is long lasting. I think it's going to take generations to really cleanse like a nation of that kind of uh, that kind of negative influence from the from the indoctrination and from the like you said, you still see that in older people. I mean, I see I still see that in my parents. Yeah, you know, last time yeah. I talked to my parents, I was like maybe 15 years ago. I, I no longer talk to them, but like you know, they were so in that um, I must lie to survive the system mentality. They would tell me to lie for no reason. You know, oh, like yeah. when I first came to America, I told them, you know, I, I got a job at a, at a TV station and my job here in America, in San Francisco. And, you know, my job was to translate news from Arabic into English. Mm -hmm. My mom, my mother uh, immediately said, oh, if you can, don't translate so accurately for them. And I was like, wow. It's like, why? Why? Yeah. Like in her mind, you have to lie to survive any system because they don't know any alternative system. So then imagine it's 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 the same here. You have to lie. And yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's very sad. It's, it's just very, very tragic. sad. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very sad. Yeah, very sad. And as I said, to me, it's like a moral relativism. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they you you're so conditioned to lie that you actually think it's normal. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's it's exactly that's that's what it is. And as I said, you know, we uh, the Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic now because we split from the Slovakia, but the, uh, we got our freedom in 1990. Mm -hmm. So this is more than 30 years and I still feel it there. You know, it's still as I said, they don't like to hear it, but I still feel it, you know, when yeah. I go back there when I visit. OK, my next slide. So this this, oh. this slide, you know, I. <laughs> I actually smile when I look at it because I'm like, how could we ever, you know, stay in it for so long? How could we ever believe it? I mean, this is such a propaganda, right? So uh, if, when I go from this, uh, I have to turn my head because I have the screen on the left hand side. But so this one says, under the leadership of Communist Party, forward to finish building of so socialism. 
Okay, so <laughs> and this one says, uh, "Long live the first uh, May, first of May, first of May in communist countries, as you probably know, was the mm -hmm. celebration of labor, right? It was mm -hmm. a labor day, uh, labor you day, know. Yeah. In, we have that, yeah. right? And so we always had these parades and everything, right? Mm -hmm. And this one says that the revolution against the regime in Slovakia was the heroic chapter in the history of our nations. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and this one is celebrating the great October revolution in uh, Soviet Union. <laughs> and you mm -hmm. see, this is on the street. This is, this is relatively to the lady with uh, the, the courage, how big these pastures were. Mm -hmm. Those were like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm laughing. It wasn't laughable then, but now I'm looking at it. I'm like, how could we ever, you know? Yeah, this is, this is another thing. Um, another thing, if anybody ever notices, is that you never see any signatures on these posters. Like, we mm -hmm. don't know who created these posters. So, like, it's like, we have the same in China, you know, it's like all these posters everywhere, but we never know who actually drew who is them. the artist behind it, right? The artist. That's why it's like when young artists here, like in America, who believe themselves to be so liberal and they want socialism, they want communism. I'm like, you want to be an artist? Do you want to put your signature on your work? <laughs> your property belongs to the state. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an artist, you should you you should be the last one to hope that you know communists or or communisms uh, will take over because you will not be able to claim. You will be anonymous. You yeah, will be exactly. anonymous servants of the system. Yeah, exactly. You you won't yeah. be able to claim, you know, uh, to be owner of your work because your work belongs to the state, and you won't be able to even choose what to draw, what to paint, and what to create. The party you're going to be you. dictated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like when yeah, sometimes when I see posters like these, I just wonder, you know, do do the young liberal artists um, ever wonder who created those posters? Why are there never autographs or signatures on those posters when mm -hmm. they're so enthusiastic about communism or mm -hmm. socialism? They have no idea what they're in for. That. Yeah, exactly. And I like how they now like to use the symbol of the fist. Oh, yeah. yeah? <laughs> you see it on all the posters, right? Over here, over here, you see the mm -hmm. symbol, right? So this symbol is 100 years old. And it was created by Marxists. Okay, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody will ever accredit the artist who created it, but mm -hmm. all the Marxists are using it, right? Mm -hmm. So that that when I see that, you know, in New York here we have a lot of graffiti. You can see it sprayed on a, you know on the walls and on the buildings here. That really is scary um, to me. Yeah, that is scary. Yeah. All right, um, let's see the next one. The next one. <laughs> Okay, so this is celebrations mm -hmm. in communism. Uh, every time we celebrated something, we had to dress up and, you know, go to parade. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is this is the young, you see the young brainwashed people, right? Those are what, 10 years old kids in a pioneer organization, right? Mm -hmm. They holding, this is a picture of Stalin, this is Lenin, and this here says, long live the pioneer organization. So, yeah. you know, the brainwashing started early. It started when you were five, six years old, and they made you believe that when you're wearing that red scarf, you know, you should be proud of it and you celebrating your country. But in fact, you were not celebrating your country. You were celebrating the regime. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the country. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we had that for many occasions, you know, the October Revolution, the May, you know, the Independence Day, whatever you name it, we always had a, a Parade like this, and you can also notice again the pictures are not very, uh, not very good. But here, down here, this is Czechoslovakian um, or today Czech Republic flag, and we still have the same flag. This mm -hmm. one is Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. in all the parades, we always had to display Soviet mm -hmm. Union, right? So again, mm -hmm. you have this was the president, first communist president of Czechoslovakia. This is mm -hmm. Lenin, of course, Engels, and Marx. Always, mm -hmm. these people had to be displayed in all the celebrations. Right? Yeah, so it, it's kind of like a religion. It's like you know, it's you know, you celebrate your own national flag, but at the same time, you have to pledge loyalty or allegiance to these these I ideologies, these yeah. Yeah. communism. Yeah. yeah, the idols. So yeah. it's 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 very cultish. You know, we yeah. had the same it's thing. Like, when, yeah, 
we, you know, wearing a red scarf, like as soon as you turn six, you are pressured to join the Young Pioneers. As soon as you turn 15, you're pressured to join the uh, Communist Youth League. Like everybody joins. If you don't join, you're considered an outcast. Of course. And yeah, it's, so it's like, but it's like, that's the system where you just automatic, automatically do it because everybody is doing it. You don't even think about it. You're not, you know, conditioned to think for yourself either if you do think. Um, you know, they, they 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 tell you, oh, you're a bad kids. You know, you want to fit in, right? You don't want to ask. Yeah, what I think yeah. I think that was that was in everybody's interest to be in that gray middle mass. You mm -hmm. don't want to stick out. Yeah, because exactly. if you stick out, you become target. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like yeah, so so people become sheep. You know, people are just like you you hide in the middle of a group of sheep, so you're safe. And you know, uh, you know but I I we spoke about it with my husband, who also came from communistic country. He actually came from China. My oh. name last name is Lu, as you probably noticed. So so mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we spoke about that, and uh, I was saying to him, you know, I can never judge anybody who actually just was in the middle of everybody else and didn't stick out and didn't protest because mm -hmm. the people who dare to protest uh they were persecuted you know mm -hmm. they didn't have a normal life they couldn't live normal life so if you or you know semi normal lives i would say so if you if you want to live like you know if you want to go to work and go to school and you have to fit in you cannot stick out so i i don't really blame people who did not try to uh, you know, we were all in here somewhere, you know, we were Absolutely. all, yeah. yeah, we were all at one point or we were all one of those, one uh, of those people, definitely. To youth leagues and, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at the time was maybe a little bit different or the, the European countries or communist European countries were a little bit different because mm -hmm. uh, our immediate neighbors were Western country, West Germany, Austria, you know, and, uh, and we hated the system, mm -hmm. but at least my generation, but I think all the generations hated the system. We really, we, we developed this art of double speak when you would say something else in a family and with friends and something else in a public, you know, we hated it, but we were at the same time because they had so much power mm -hmm. at the same time, we were afraid to speak up, to speak mm -hmm. against it. And it took, 20 years for the generation of my mom to speak mm -hmm. against it. Uh, I have a later on, I have a slide about it. Mm -hmm. And it took another 20 years for my generation to uprise against it again. And when we did, finally, we, we succeeded, my generation succeeded, but uh, people were afraid. It, it wasn't like they didn't even understand. They just kind of, they, it's like when you have a horse and you put, you know, the, the shades on a horse, we kind of look in front of us, we lived our lives. We didn't want to get involved in anything because that was the only way to live semi-normally, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do our next slide. Mm -hmm. So my next slide is very interesting. So we had a, a love-hate relationship with uh, Stalinism uh, when I was, mm -hmm. when, when I, uh, in my country, when I wasn't born yet. This was a generation of my mom and my grandma. So Stalin was, of course, uh, the big model uh, at the beginning of the communism in the 40s and 50s. And then, of course, uh, that his ideology was uh, kind of thrown away. People stopped believing in him. So my country built this huge monument in it took like five years for them to build it. Um, my grandma used to call it the line for meat because it looks like the people are lining up. <laughs> there. So oh, the nice. line for meat, that was the, the people's uh, name for it. And uh, then immediately, because by then, Soviet Union kind of said, okay, Stalin was not good. So then it was demolished in 1962. This thing was 15 meters tall. So that's over 40, 40 feet tall. It was huge. You can see the little people underneath there, right? It was a huge wow. monument to Stalin, right? And then, of course, mm -hmm. the uh, the order came from Moscow that we don't go with Stalin anymore. So we had to demolish it. So this is the demolition of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, today in a free society, we have a sun clock there. And the sun clock uh, kind of symbolizes the uh, away from the communism, the time away mm -hmm. from communism. So today we have a beautiful 
mm -hmm. sunlight. That yeah, looks um, much better. Uh, well, it's not little. It's also it's also 40, 40 years, 40, 40, 40 feet tall. But uh, you know, so it's mm -hmm. one of the major parks in Prague. So I just wanted to show you how the ideologies were changing. Um, you know, when one of the idols uh, got uh, thrown out, and then another idol came in. So Stalin mm -hmm. was a big obsession in the fifties. After fifties, no longer, mm -hmm. right? So. We built yeah. it and then we demolished it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad to see that it's been replaced with something at least it's aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Today, today people go to skating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and this, uh, oh boy. I am pretty sure I don't even have to translate that, right? I mean, you probably had something similar. This is. The ID book, it was a book where you will have your achievements, kind of, you know, it wasn't just like a, a card ID, it was actually book ID of the Communistic Party of Czechoslovakia. You're mm -hmm. supposed to be really, really proud when you get it, because you mm -hmm. had to prove your worthiness mm -hmm. to enter the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you were not in a Communist Party, you had absolutely no access or privilege in the country at the time. Mm -hmm. My mom was forced to join Communist Party so I could go to college. Mm -hmm. And I remember she was crying about it. She was not a member and uh, my father was also not a member. And they were kind of, you know, revolutionary a little bit. And uh, then uh, her uh, boss basically said, look, if one of you doesn't go, you know, doesn't become the member of party, your daughter will not be able to enter college. So she did, but they had a fight about yeah. it. She was crying. Yeah, but this was the ID. Yeah, I believe my father had something similar to that because he joined the party very early, earlier on, like when he was, he was a firm believer. He is still a firm believer of communism and Maoism. So, yeah. Okay. So. As I was talking about before, we actually did two uprising in Czech Czechoslovakia against the communism. The first one was not successful. So the first one, uh, the uh, at the time leadership of Communist Party decided that they want to do something they would call a communism with a human face. And <laughs> <laughs> right? It's funny when you just say that. And uh, when they went to Moscow to present that uh, idea, Moscow wasn't very pleased about it, of course. And uh, and again, we were not part of Soviet Union. We were just one of the satellite communist countries. Yeah. So this is how much influence they had over us, even though we were not uh, part of Soviet Union. So ideologically, of course, we were, but yeah. Um, so uh, the Soviet Union, the Moscow leadership sent tank to Prague and people, you know, uprised against the Prague. You can also see it. Uh, it's, it's been called the Prague Spring 1968. Mm -hmm. And you can see my beautiful Prague. Prague is such a beautiful city, a historic, dates down to 11th century. And, uh, and they... They came with parks and uh, with tanks, and they started to shoot around and, uh, and and destroy everything. And the Soviet soldiers believed that we are terrorists and we trying to destroy Soviet Union. And you know, so I remember I was very very little, so I don't remember much. But I remember this one time we were walking with my mama on the street, and suddenly she pushed me in one of the entrance of the houses, and she covered me with her body. And then I heard this loud bangs, you know, and uh, so I remember that. And so I asked her about that and she said, well, they were driving the tanks through streets of Prague and just randomly kind of shoot into the windows. Oh my so, goodness. So you know, we were on the street. So I was trying to cover you so you don't, you know, you don't get hurt. Or I remember they were on a bridge and uh, we could see the bridge from the window of my apartment, of our apartment. And it was at night and they were shooting out of you know they were just shooting into the river it just you wow. know killing killing time i guess and i was saying to my mom yay mom i see falling stars oh and wow. my mom said well and i said it's not falling stars it's actually mm -hmm. tanks shooting into the river you know so that I'm was 1968. yeah that was 1968 and i just want to say mm -hmm. you know czech people czechoslovakian people we never use weapons in any of our uprisings against uh, the regime in the revolutions, we never had, we never used weapons. I mean, we, you know, do, before the communism, of course, we have ownerships of weapons. But as you know, regimes who want to take control, the first thing they will take ever from you is weapons. So we were not allowed to have weapons during 
uh, you know, guns during communism. So we could never use guns. We could never use weapons. So they sent tanks on, on armed people. That reminds me of the Tiananmen massacre. It's exactly. so similar. These pictures just reminds me of what happened in China in the last several decades too. It's like so similar. It's like they do the same thing all over the world. It doesn't matter where they are because the ideology inspires them to do the same things, which is just terrifying. Exactly. And that, that is, you know, that's what, that's again, why we are here, why we talking about it because People, we are sensitive to it because we lived in the exact same regime. I talked to my husband who came out of China and we had the same childhood experience. Mm -hmm. And we very much starting to recognize the traces of it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, we know, we know, we lived yeah. it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it was China or Czechoslovakia or, mm -hmm. you know. All right. So mm -hmm. the next one. So this is what is now known as Velvet Revolution. And again, Velvet, because we didn't have weapons, didn't use any weapons. And mm -hmm. this actually started with a student protests against the regime. And those are the students you see, they kneeling on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, you know, they, 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 there was a slogan, we have empty hands. They didn't have any weapons. They didn't have anything. And mm -hmm. they, uh, they sent an uh, army on them with weapons and batons and they you know beat some of the students so they killed one of them and they beat some of the students to the point that they have to be taken to hospital i have my own personal experience with it because when it all started when this the students were on the street of prague uh i as you as i probably mentioned before my big hobby and former profession was a ballroom dancing. I used to be a professional dancer. And uh, mm -hmm. at the time, me and my partner, we actually had a show very close to that uh, street wow. where the students were beaten. And wow. we were uh, driving our car to the show and the whole area was blocked by, by police cars and army, you know, and, and we were like, oh my God, two people somewhere said something against the regime and they blocked the whole area again. You know, we were making fun of it. And we didn't know that the revolution started. So we did our show, came back home, and we heard on a radio call to arms, you know, basically, and come, come to the square, come to the square. It's happening. I'm, I'm emotional even talking about it. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's 1989 when Tiananmen protests happened as well. I think that was like a big year in 1989. That was, yeah, the Berlin Wall went down that yeah. year. It yeah. was like a turning point for so many nations in the world at the time. I was only like 11 years old, you know, none of this was, because this was huge, the Velvet Revolution. I only learned about it after I became adults and yeah. came to America. But none of this was ever reported in China. Like we had no idea the Berlin Wall fell. Nobody knew. Um, yeah, well of course, they control the information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had no idea that the Velvet Revol Revolution happened. And mm -hmm. of course, in Tiananmen happened, everybody knew, but then it got crushed. And after that, everything about Tiananmen was wiped out from media, from textbooks, from people's hearts or minds. And so it's like, you know, to us, like the Communist Party of China just erased history like that. And, you know, um, 1.4 billion people today probably still don't know anything about the Velvet Revolution or the Berlin Wall or any of it. It's, it's just, I I don't know. It's like when you erase your own history, it, it's erasing part of who you are, really. It's Exactly, exactly. And all oppressive regimes will always do that. They will mm -hmm. always erase the history because yeah. they don't want to, people to know. They want to teach them what they think you should know not exactly. you know i mean i grew up in a in a schools when they were telling us how bad capitalism is and how oppressed people are and how mm -hmm. they cannot do what they want to do you know which is yeah. yeah but anyway so this was this was the velvet revolution i'm somewhere here i'm sure oh, i was standing wow. there you know i was at the time i was 25 years old uh Oh my yes. God, I was so excited. And I, and I still, I, as I said, I get emotional when I just see the slides. So yeah. it was, and then we were so happy when they finally said oh. that they abdicated, you know, it was, it was, it was time I will never forget. Yeah. yeah I, I envy you in some ways, you know, to be part of such historical moments. It's like, it's just massive, you know, it's, it's enormous and, and it's, you know, it's something that, you know, 
no one can take away from you, you know, to be part of that historical moment. You know, that's that will always stay stay with you, you know, for as long yeah. as you live. And that's just an amazing experience. An amazing it is. Experience. And I'm I'm very, I'm very glad I was there. I'm very mm -hmm. proud that, you know, oh. I was there and we did it and we were scared, but we did it. You know? yeah. I'm so proud to be to be acquainted with you. <laughs> Oh, oh no, thank you. I, I didn't start the revolution. I was just mere participant, but you know, oh. it's still, it took courage because, you know, mm -hmm. so there's, these are the statistics. I mean, this is the memorial now we have in Prague. When you go to Prague, you can go and visit it uh, to the victims of communism in Prague. And there are statistics, you know, written on that monument. So uh, we are a small country. We only have 10 million people, but you can see how many people from that received mm -hmm. sentences for political reason. How many people went forced to exile, you know, all these uh, bright minds, minds of my country, intellectuals, you know, they had to leave because they couldn't, they, they would be in a jail, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people died in a prison? How many people was, were executed from 10 million of people? Those are big numbers, very big yeah. numbers. Yeah, incredible. So, Just you incredible. Know, yeah. Wow. And now this is Prague now. This is how mm -hmm. Prague looks now. It was, we made, you know, people, not me, not I, but people made new facades and they uh, renovated the historic uh, buildings. And uh, I really recommend that you go and visit Prague. Prague is a beautiful, vibrant mm -hmm. city now, but it wasn't when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And and my last slide is my life in United States. I don't know if you want to see it, but uh, oh, so this cool. is this is I me now. <laughs> oh, so wow! This is my husband and I. We, this is our wedding. We had both the traditional Chinese and and the Western wedding. And uh, this wow. is uh, by now. I'm not a professional dancer anymore. Neither is my husband. We mm -hmm. both have our day jobs, and this is our hobby. But we are very good. We are, uh, you know champions in america and we won many international competitions and we were mm -hmm. uh, you know winners of many uh we, we were in the finals of world championships so we are pretty good dancers mm -hmm. but uh, so this is our dancing and this picture down here you know this is this is the sentiment this is me when i first arrived to the united states you cannot quite see it the picture is blurry and old but there is white house here and I remember oh. sitting, you know, they, they, they didn't have a fencing around the White House back then, you know, mm -hmm. there was just this and then the lawn and the White House. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm here, I'm in the United States, you know. That's wonderful. Yeah. So that's my show. <laughs> oh, wow. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for that. I really, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I just want to say it's just amazing to see the change after communism was toppled and, you know, Prague is beautiful again. Like, I think I mentioned this to you, my old roommate back in the dormitory, uh, uh, back in the dormitory at the China Radio International, uh, she was a Czech language student and she actually went to study in Prague in 2002, from 2002 to 2003. And when she came back, yeah, she just had this amazing breakthrough. You know, she told me that Prague was so beautiful and the Czech people were like so amazingly friendly and uh, you know it's such a prosperous country and and she totally changed her mind about the Chinese system you know before mm -hmm. that she was yeah she would she would tell me that you know I was crazy for wanting to leave China you know such a stable job such a stable life you know why do you want to leave and and after after coming back from Czech she completely changed she supported my decision to leave she said yes freedom is more precious I, I can see your point of view. If you're not happy here, you know, go pursue your life, pursue your your own, you know, person. And unfortunately, she's still stuck stuck in China right now, like you know, so caring sorry. for her aging parents. But, yeah, but, 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 but what you said is exactly the point I wanted to make today. So as I said, these slides, you know, they show the economic impact of uh, communism. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I hope the the few pictures from the revolution also showed how much people need freedom of expression and freedom of speech because mm -hmm. if you don't have it you you know you can survive on bread and water but you cannot survive when you don't have freedom of mind expression uh, speech you know absolutely yeah and it's like for me it's like like you said at the beginning of the show you know freedom of speech is kind of slipping away 
from this country, from our from our culture, and I see that looming on the horizon, and it's extremely concerning. It's like people, you know, who believe that uh, you know freedom of speech should be undermined uh, for to curb misinformation, for example, or hate speech, and then you know it's like okay, that's all fine, but there is uh, you know a bottom line where like where you shouldn't cross, like you shouldn't shut people down or label people simply for expressing a different exactly. opinion. But um, that, that is that is the first tactic of any oppressive mm -hmm. regime, right? To divide people and start make them make them fight against each other. That that yeah. is the that's the Marxism, right? You have the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. You have to divide people in the classes, and then you start revolution. And that's mm -hmm. that's their ideology right now. Yeah, absolutely. It is it is scary. So, yeah, I hope um, you know what we're doing here is going to have some impact on people's minds and, and, and hearts. And hopefully what you have shown us here and your stories will inspire more people, especially immigrants, you know, from oppressive regimes. It doesn't matter whether it's communist re regime or just a, an autocrat regime, like they all have the same tactics, which is divide people so they can take full control. Yeah, if you like our show and if you like our immigrant stories, or if you're an immigrant who would like to share your stories and uh, just comment uh, underneath the video and or and we'll follow Lily and contact Lily on, on her social media and to let us know. Um, so is, is there anything you would like to add, Katarina, um, <laughs> uh, before we wrap up? I don't think so. I'm, I'm very happy that I could be again on your show. And, uh, uh, and I'm very happy that I could share my experience. And, you know, just I just want to say I'm worried and people who experienced uh, totalitarian regimes are worried. They see the signs coming up here in America. And so just don't let it happen here. Yeah, totally. I agree. All right. Thank you so much for, for your presentation today. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again some sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having me.